the last part of this presentation, which is not uh, very fundamental stuff, but just one slide that I want to show. Again, given, given that we have so many Fortran programmers here, uh, just to give you a, a feeling of how the Fortran looks like, uh, for instance, for in PGI's CUDA Fortran, as I said, the one approach is the mixed language approach. So basically, on the on the Fortran side, you have a call my func. Oh, the, there is a C missing. <laughs> call my func, and then you have an extern C C function that then launches the the kernel. So that's one approach. Um, the upside is it works with any compiler. Um, fairly straightforward. The only problem is that you have to worry about a the calling conventions that. Uh, whether you need to underscore the function name or not when you call C from, from the Fortran side. Um, and you have to worry about two different languages, so that can be a bit inconvenient. Now with uh, PGI's CUDA Fortran, um, you have extensions to Fortran that, uh, for instance, if you have an array U that has a certain dimension, you can create arrays uh, that are, have the attribute device that will live on the GPU. And so by simply by assigning U to A, you're copying data between host and GPU. Um, you have a mechanism for calling kernels. So you, uh, CUDA Fortran also supports the triple Chevron notation. Um, so otherwise, those are similar, simple functions with now an attribute called global uh, that it identifies these subroutines as kernels. So this is not meant to be an example. It just should give you a bit of flavor, a feeling for how it looks like to, to write CUDA Fortran code. Um, the, the upside is definitely that you have a, um, a, a very Fortran-like approach to CUDA. The downside is that it's currently only supported by PGI. But PGI's compiler is available on Cody. Um, so you can give it a try there if you just want to play around with um, some examples. Okay, so what I didn't talk about this morning was anything about optimization. And frankly, there's a lot of talks out online about doing optimizations in general, CUDA optimizations. There is lots of material. Uh, please just go out and, and Google for whatever, CUDA optimization, and you will find uh, various presentations. Um, I also can talk about streams um, in, in very much detail, so we'll, we'll come back to that. And uh, the multi-GPU programming is another thing that um, I simply ignored so far. Okay, now coming to this afternoon's topic, which is uh, CUDA 5 and Kepler. So first I, I want to talk a bit about Kepler itself, what the, what the chip does and what the des design decisions were behind it. And then later on come to some of the, the new features that are supported by CUDA 5. For those of you who knew Turdy before it became an XK7, where while it was still an XK6, at that point it had a Fermi-based GPU, which is just the, the generation before Kepler. Um, Kepler devices became available early 2012, and the GK110 became available in the second half of, um, of 2012. The goal was to provide a step up in terms of performance from the previous generation to also make it much more energy efficient. So basically, increasing performance and drawing more power, that's quote unquote easy. But improving performance without requiring more power, that's, that's much more difficult. And that was the goal of, of the Kepler um, device. And the last um, focus was on programmabil programmability, uh, so to make life easier for developers to get to a good utilization of the device. So we come back to the famous uh, GK110 block diagram um, <clears throat> with the, the 15 streaming multiprocessors. 
And here's the subtle difference, right? GK110, that's the name of the chip that sits on the GPU. And that's, a, that's the, the chip that's a whole family of different products. And the K20X, the GPU that you have in 30, is one product that has a GK110 chip. Now, the different products that are being produced with, with this one chip differ in the number of streaming multiprocessors that you have. So while a GK110 chip can have up to 15 streaming multiprocessors, the products that are being sold have either 14 or 13 or even fewer uh, streaming multiprocessors. So that's where the, the whole confusion came about why, how many SMs that there are. On a, a GK110 chip, in theory, you can have up to 15 streaming multiprocessors. Technicality, and given that you're not buying the machine, but it's already there, it doesn't really matter. But it's, um, yeah, just wanted to, to mention that. Um, so yeah, we have up to 15 streaming multiprocessors. Each one of those chips can, in theory, deliver more than a teraflop of uh, floating point, um, double precision floating point performance. Has a sizable cache that's twice as large as the one that we had on the Fermi chip and has a 384-bit uh, GDR5 interface to the memory on the device. I'm not particularly keen on, on all these technical numbers, but some of these numbers can be useful to just have somewhere sitting around for reference if you're doing a theoretical performance analysis of a kernel. Right? If you know that your kernel doesn't do anything else, then reading data from GPU memory onto the streaming multiprocessors and writing it back out, you should be able to at least get close to the theori theoretical bandwidth that you could have on this device. And you can infer that from the width of your bus, the clock of your, um, of your memory system, and that's another one of those numbers that you can determine based on the uh, um, either look up in the specs or, or determined by, by some figures that are reported by tools that are available on 2D. So that's a, a, a weak but some of a, somewhat of a justification for showing you these numbers. Anyway, comparing the Kepler streaming multiprocessor to the, to, to the Fermi streaming multiprocessor shows that what happened between these two generations is that the amount of parallelism has increased again quite dramatically. So we have many more of the floating point units that sit on, on each one of these um, processors. We have more double precision units and um, they have introduced new instructions that can help you get more performance out of the chip. A bit in more detail, what has changed? So we have more floating point units that can lead to a higher throughput of, of floating point instructions. But that's not all. We can also have more CUDA blocks per SM. On Fermi, it was up to eight blocks. On Kepler, we can have up to 16 blocks that can sit on the same SM. Now, if you remember the, the, the previous presentation, having more blocks that are sitting on an SM allows you to better hide the access latency, for instance, for global memory accesses. So with more blocks being able to, to be resident on a streaming multiprocessor, this can potentially help you get better, um, finally get better performance, get better utilization of your, of your chip. Yes? I want to have one of those Britney Spears head things. things. <laughs> um, 
Right. And so what you can see is that a lot of the, um, of the other resources, many of those increase by a factor of two. Particularly interesting for a lot of applications is the, the size of the register file. So you have twice as many registers that are available um, that can also help you to uh, finally to improve the performance of your kernels. And then finally, you have the, the amount of shared memory that has remained the same. Now, this may seem like a limitation, but there is actually some changes in the architecture that help you avoid use of shared memory that you had in previous cases. Um, and I'll come back to that in a second. So what this shows is that <clears throat> instead of just saying, OK, let's double the number of floating point units that we have on this chip, we went through all the uh, kind of analysis of the different workloads that are used on, on GPUs. And it was based on these analyses, it was decided to increase the different types of resources um, in a case-by-case -case basis. So <clears throat> some of the, of the changes with, um, with Kepler. With Fermi, you had a, a certain number of registers available, 32,000 um, altogether. And when you do the math, when you think about how many blocks and how many threads you could have theoretically resident on a streaming multiprocessor, it turns out that you can use something like 20, 21 or so registers per thread maximum. Now, if you were not fully, fully using the, the streaming multiprocessor, so if you had fewer resident threads than potentially could go there, you could increase the register use of a thread up to 63 registers. But there was no way that any thread could have more than 63 registers um, simply because the width of the, um, of, the, uh, um, of the address for addressing registers in the instructions was too short, only had whatever, 63, that's eight bits. Um, available to, to address that. Six bits, six bits. And so one of the changes now with Fe uh, Fermi is that we can actually use all the way up to 255 registers per thread. Now, if you're using 255 registers per thread, you're not going to get as many blocks on the SM as you could. Um, if you want to have so-called full occupancy, so if you want to have as many threads resident on an SM as you, as you can, you're still limited to 31 registers. But that's already a step up that's almost 50% more than you had before. Um, so when you have a kernel that is occupancy limited, on Kepler, there's a certain chance that you get, um, that you get your occup occupancy higher now. Or if you had a kernel that had to spill a lot of registers, that again should not no longer be the case. Right? I, I just if you think of it in right, all the registers on Kepler or on previous generations are 32 bits wide. So if you have double precision code, and especially when you have double precision complex numbers, that already uses four registers for one number. Um, so it's it's fairly easy to use up a lot of registers in your kernels. And so having access to more of them can be a very good um, a way of avoiding to move data between global memory and the streaming multiprocessor. Then there was a, a whole range of additional instructions. Uh, actually, one entirely new instruction that was added, the so-called intra-warp data exchange or, or intra-warp shuffle instruction. Then the atomic operations saw a significant redesign and significant performance improvement. And then there's some other operations, other instructions that are mainly useful to the compiler, so not to the end user, but it also helps the compiler to create better code. So we will go through these three groups in the following. So the first one, the and somewhat most exciting one, is the, uh, the intra-warp shuffle instruction. <clears throat> 
So if this morning was the first time that you heard about CUDA, then that's probably a bit confusing. But remember, if you wanted to have threads within a block communicating with each other, the only way in previous generation GPUs was to move data to shared memory. Uh, so one thread moves it to shared memory, and the other thread reads it out of shared memory. So you always had to go through shared memory for, uh, for this exchange. Now, um, the problem with that is that you need to allocate this shared memory. So even if you're within your kernel, you can reuse some of the shared memory as, as time goes on. Um, you still have to allocate a buffer for that. And as we saw, shared memory is limited and therefore a, a scarce resource. What Shuffle allows you now is that within a bundle of these threads, within a warp, you can now grab data from, from a, any one of, the, of your neighboring threads or from any thread in the same warp. So there's basically three different forms of Shuffle. One says that each thread can just say, I want to get the data from thread whatever, five. Thread one says, I want to get data from thread five. Thread two says, I want to get my data from thread seven, and so on. So arbitrary indexed uh, pattern. Then there's two for shifting operations. So if you need to do exchange data with your nearest neighbors. And then you have a butterfly exchange that can be particularly helpful in cases like FFTs, where you have these butterfly reductions and you need to grab data from uh, further and further away elements. So, um, right. One standard example, especially when you go and, and search for uh, CUDA optimization presentations, is this exa example where you uh, do a parallel prefix sum. So a parallel prefix sum is the algorithm that takes an array of um, a certain number of elements, and you're computing the array that contains the sum of the elements up down here, the sum of the elements up to this element. So you have three, then you have three plus, L, uh, three plus eight is 11, three plus eight plus two is 13, and so on. And so you can do a lot of cool operations with, uh, with this parallel prefix sum. Now, the way that you usually do it in CUDA, in the old implementations, was that you had this array in shared memory, and then each thread goes out and grabs his, his one up element and adds it to, to himself, and then you go up and, and grab the, the two up element, or sorry, three up element, and then the four up elements, and you add them together. Um, with shuffle, you don't need to do that. You don't need the, the round trip anymore. You can just say, I want, I want the value from one element up, or I want the value of two elements up, and so on. So that's, um, that's a cool thing to, to do. For instance, um, we have this one case of a, a code that needs to do a lot of small matrix matrix products um, up to or down to something like five by five elements. And for that one, we can do this entirely in with these products within a single warp, right? Because the five by five element matrix has 25 elements. So that's less than the 32 elements that you have in a warp. And so for that, the entire matrix matrix product can be done exclusively with warp shuffles. So it's, it's, it's one of these instructions where, yeah, when you, when you write the kernel and you see that you're running out of shared memory, think if there's a way of, of using a warp shuffle instruction. Yes? How do you use the instructions? It's shown exactly here. So here it's underscore, underscore, shuffle up. And then you have a value. So let's see, right? Um, so yeah, it's an intrinsic. And you know, we had recently a, a philosophical discussion about what, what we like about the CUDA model and whatnot. And I mean, 
it is to some degree way too low level for something that you, you want to worry about. That's also why it's prefixed with an underscore underscore. It's kind of a hardcore optimization option, but it is actually very helpful simply because it, it allows you to bypass this resource limit that you have otherwise, which is the amount of shared memory. <clears throat> so yeah, it's not, you probably shouldn't start designing a kernel by saying, okay, I want to use my, my shuffle instruction. Um, it, it should be a consideration that you do way, way down the road. Okay, atomic instructions. I didn't mention atomics this morning, so just very briefly, um, right? The GPU is a very massively parallel system, and you have multiple streaming multiprocessors that might be working on the same um, data element in global memory. So if you are not careful, it could happen that you're creating a race condition because multiple threads try to update the same value in global memory. Um, atomic instructions are a safe way, a mechanism to allow you to avoid this race condition. Now, the very early CUDA programmable GPUs didn't even have atomics. So you had to write your algorithm in a way to avoid atomics. Then later on, generations offered atomics, but the performance of it was very poor. And that, um, yeah, you could only use it kind of as a last resort if it was really too hard to write your algorithm in a way that you would avoid um, atomic updates in global memory. With, um, with Kepler, atomics are actually so fast that they are, in many cases, only slightly slower than global memory accesses. And um, you have a whole range of, of operations on both 32 and 64-bit um, values. So that's doing actual arithmetic, adding, and then compare and swapping. So that's useful for creating locks in global memory, exchanges, and, and then minning and maxing. So yeah, the um, atomics now become a true mechanism for, for designing your kernels, and it shouldn't be just used as, a, as, a, as an excuse for not having to think. Um, again, one, an example is here. If you had an array and you wanted to compute the sum of all the elements in this array, what you would do in previous generations is you would take your long array, break it up into chunks, and each one of these sections would be processed by one of the streaming multiprocessors. Given that there is no way of communicating between the streaming multiprocessors, each one would write his own uh, partial sum out to global memory. And then you would have to launch a, sec a new kernel that would reduce all these partial sums into the final result. With atomics, you can save yourself this two-step process. And basically, each thread block computes its local partial sum and then does an atomic up update in, uh, in global memory. And given that this is atomic, you know that after, so if this thread block has computed his, um, uh, his partial sum, he, and he does an atomic update, he will know that during the time after he read the value from global, from global memory, added his partial sum, and wrote it back out, then in this whole process, there was no other thread that was messing around with the value in global memory. So again, that's, that's one of those programmability features that helps you just write code without a lot of um, uh, yeah, complications to avoid these type of race conditions. An example here is that um, there is a code, um, specfem, which is a, uh, a spectral element code. And the authors spent a lot of time and effort in, so the one problem with spectral element codes is that you have uh, nodes that are sitting on, on adjacent or that, that are shared between multiple elements. And so you, you have this problem that you might update um, nodes from the different elements concurrently. And so in order to avoid this race conditions, the authors went through lengths of coming up with a, a mesh coloring scheme that would avoid that you have ever the situation of, of touching the same nodes uh, concurrently and so on. 
and it, it actually helped very much on Fermi. But with Kepler, all this effort is basically gone. They can now just use atomic updates in global memory, and they get good performance. So again, it can help you save a lot of effort by just using atomics. Yes? Right, absolutely, Ab absolutely. So I mean, one thing to keep in mind is, yeah, I mean, with, <laughs> with, with many of these statements, you want, one has to be a bit careful because it, it's really dependent on the, on the exact context under which this, this happens. Um, in case of the atomics, one of the big questions is how many, um, how many concurrent accesses do you actually have on the same variable, right? So and, yeah, with another, with another code, we have this issue that um, for guaranteeing correctness, we need to do an at atomic update. But probability that you have a conflict is very slim. And so in that case, it's actually affordable to do it at the very fine granularity to, to use atomic updates, simply because you're not, you're not locking out everybody else at that point. Um, the other threads can, still can do their job. They still can do their atomic updates on, on different parts of the memory. But yes, if you have a lot of contention, right? if, if there was uh, thousands of blocks and they all had exactly the same number of operations, so you could assume that they would very closely to each other finish their local computation and they would all hit the same one variable in global memory at the same time, there you probably want to make sure that you have a fair amount of work that happens on a per block basis, just to, to relax a bit the, um, the number of contentions that you have on, the, on this one uh, variable. So yeah, it's, it, it's a trade-off again. Yeah. Okay, another one, um, another change that was made with Kepler uh, is related to, te to textures. So one is that the performance of textures got significantly improved. Now, one thing that uh, people tend to forget in the HPC community is that um, GPUs come out of the graphical side. So there's a lot of, of hardware available that is concentrating on graphics features, one of them being textures. Now, what textures are, are, again, on the graphic side, is basically you have a triangle and you want to put some, a certain texture onto this triangle. And so what, the, what this feature does is it allows you to do automatic interpolation between um, adjacent values. It has um, additional caches when coming from global memory to make sure that you have good performance for accessing elements that are not nicely aligned with each other. So, um, yeah, that's, that, there's all these hardware. However, using this hardware in previous versions of GPUs was sometimes a bit painful. And depending on the, um, on the application, it was also not, um, it couldn't be as fast as accessing global memory. Now, what changed with the, with the, the SMX is that we have not only faster texture operations, but we also have more texture cache. But the, the really cool feature is now that we have an additional data path from global memory that sits below L2 cache through the texture cache into the streaming multiprocessors. So previously, we had to go through this texturing hardware, which is a bit painful to set up. So you had to have some some, a bunch of function calls to just set up the textures. You had to bind them and you had to, to use a separate call to, to access the elements in there. Um, there is now a separate data path that basically says, load me this value through the texture cache into my streaming multiprocessor. 
There is a way of accessing this instruction uh, directly. It's called LDG, and it's another one of those fairly low-level instructions. That's why it's, it has a double underscore prefix. But in theory, the compiler should be smart enough to detect accesses that could go through this data path by itself. The way to do that is to label variables with the qualifiers const and restrict. Why is that? So textures are fed through a read-only read cache. Right, they're, they're a pure read-only mechanism. And so if you're telling the compiler that you have a variable, an array, that is guaranteed to be only read, and if you guarantee to the compiler that there is no other pointer that could possibly modify the data that you're trying to read, then it's safe enough for the compiler to say, hmm, I might not need to go through the, the usual data path, which goes from L1, uh, from L2 through L1 into the streaming multiprocessor, but to actually get it through the texture pipe. So as a programmer, what that means to you is that just make sure that you're labeling your variables with const restrict um, when you can do it. So for instance, here we have a SACSP. So it's a scalar stretching of a vector. And what do you, what do you add to your standard um, Signature is just the, the constant the restrict modifier to your input variable, and it will tell the compiler to use the LDG instruction to load data. So, other kind of cool features. Yeah, we have more efficient um, memory controller. That means we have higher bandwidth to, to global memory. Uh, we have more L2 cache, so chances are higher that you will find your data actually in, in the L2 cache. But keep in mind, caches, again, it's, it's not like on a CPU where you're doing a cache blocking to make sure that your data sits in cache. Because you have so many threads that are accessing data in a, in a very unpredictable manner that it's very hard to write a code with these caches in mind. But the goal is that you just, that the hardware will provide you a mechanism to quicker access data than, um, than you would have to, th than if you would have to go all the way out to global memory. And then the last one is that uh, error correction. One of the, the features that you have on the, on the Tesla devices as we have in Kepler is um, um, error correcting memory. So it's, it's capable of detecting bit errors and correcting them. Um, that the performance of that one has been increased quite dramatically. Now, if you have a Fermi code, what do you need to do? Um, in theory, as long as you embed the so-called PTX code in your, um, in, in your GPU code, um, it will just run on Kepler. So there's nothing you need to do. In order to get somewhat better results, you, you certainly want to recompile. And given that there is now some, some Small changes on the surface, but actually fundamentally different differences, fundamental differences, like the warp shuffle instruction, that's something that you as a programmer have to take advantage of it. So it, it might make sense to go back to, to the kernels that you have, the ones that you really care about the performance, and tune them for Kepler. But again, that's not something that you want to do for every single kernel. It's for the ones that you really care about. So now, one thing with Kepler is that, as I said, the, the, the amount of parallelism that the device offers has been significantly increased. Oops. And so it becomes challenging in, in many cases that an application by itself can take advantage of all of the, of the full device. And so one of the focuses of Kepler was to make sure that there's good mechanisms of having multiple grids that run concurrently on the same device at the same time. So I come back a bit to the, to the concept of streams. Right? 
when you have your host application and um, it launches a bunch of, of kernels, if they are in the same stream, they will be moved, they will be put onto the, onto the, the streaming multiprocessors in order. And then if you have like the grade one, two and three and so on, they will be in order dispatched to the SM. So the grade one will be put on the, on the SM. And then whatever, SM0 will f finish first because for whatever reason the, the kernels that you had that were dispatched to this streaming multiprocessor finished first. Well, now you create a, a big load imbalance and that means you have wasted resources here. They are just, this guy is just sitting idle and waiting for the other grid to finish. Now, if you have a second stream and you had the same situation, so you had again grid one that is, that fills the entire GPU. And then the kernels on, on the streaming multiprocessor zero had completed. Well, the grid management unit knows that from the first stream, it cannot start executing kernels because that's part of the, of the programming model that one kernel only starts after the previous one has completed if those kernel launches are in the same stream. But there's no guarantee of an order of kernel launches that are placed in different streams. And so the grid management unit now has the freedom of starting grade five, which comes in from a different stream on streaming multiprocessor zero and continue to, to, to work on those. So this helps to better utilize the entire device, which is particularly useful if you have a lot of small kernels that operate on, or kernels that operate on relatively small grids. Um, so in that case, it might be useful to use multiple streams. Um, another example is for, for using streams are asynchronous data transfers. And I think we, we heard that this morning already from, from Alistair. So basically, right, if you, if you would have just synchronous transfers and we have some work on the CPU that then hands off data to the GPU, so it's taking a certain amount of time to, to migrate data to the GPU, the GPU then processes all this data and it takes a certain amount of time until the result comes back to the CPU. Well, with asynchronous transfers, so with the ability of moving data while you're processing data on the GPU, you can significantly cut down the, um, the overall time spent between um, start of the operation and, and finish. And the way to do that is to use the asynchronous memory transfer uh, function. So instead of CUDA mem copy, it's now CUDA mem copy async, which is exactly the same as CUDA mem copy. It only, as an additional parameter, takes this stream ID. And the other thing is that in the kernel launches, as we learned this morning, you now have to provide the stream ID as well. Now, some of you might say, well, that, that has been advertised for Fermi as well. We, we, weren't we able to launch grids concurrently on Fermi? And that's true. Fermi did allow you to do that. But there's some technical challenges that made it very hard to get the desired effect. Basically, what Fermi allowed you was to have a 16-way concurrency, so you could have up to 16 streams. And those streams would then feed the kernel launches in these individual streams onto the, the hardware work queue. And then you had a dispatch unit here on the side that was looking at the hardware work queue and said, oh, I have a streaming multiprocessor that's currently idle, not doing anything. I'll take the next available kernel here and put it onto onto that resource. Now, given that there was only a single hardware queue, it was hard to get good overlap because, well, there was only limited situations where you could see kernels from, kernel launches from one queue, uh, from one stream, and kernel launches from another stream that were available. So only at the tape out of A, B, and C, it would see, oh, I can now start launching the P kernel. <laughs> So you had a lot of these 
so-called false dependencies, where in theory, after A or while A was working, it could already have started with P. But the, the unit that was scheduling the work didn't have access to P. It didn't see that there was something, something coming down the road that could be done concurrently. With Kepler, this has improved dramatically because now there's not only a single work cube, but there's multiple work cubes. So the unit that sits over here and then finally dispatches the work can make the best possible decision at any given time for the available resources. It can see, oh, my A is now, um, in order to start B, I, have, I still have to wait for a few more blocks that are part of kernel A, but I can start with P now. And so that, this feature helps you to better utilize, again, the, the overall GPU. And just as a, um, how this was accomplished, just a different way of, of looking at the problem. Here we had these different queues that were all, uh, the different streams that were all put into a single work queue that then was dispatched out to the individual streaming multiprocessors. That's the, the Fermi world. And now with Kepler, we have this additional grid management unit in between that A can select better from the different streams to place the next, um, the next kernel. And another cool feature is this, this line that goes back, and we will come back to that later. But that's, um, that enables a whole lot of additional um, cool applications. Now, the fact that we have these multiple work queues is called hyperqueue. And it just enables more efficient scheduling, and especially in case of MPI applications that can have a dramatic impact. Right, so if you imagine that you have a single thread that tries to work with multiple streams and in, in the Fermi picture, right, where it's very, where you very carefully have to schedule what kernel is being launched at what point so that you get good overlap of the execution. Well, you can possibly do that, and people have, with heroic efforts have, have managed to, do good, uh, to get good overlap of kernel launches. But if you're not saying that it's not within a sing single application, but if you want to have multiple CPU processes that all share the same GPU, that all launch work on the GPU, well, that's pretty much impossible to get this good scheduling and this tight scheduling to make sure that you have a good um, no false dependencies. And so with HyperQ, or so, so this situation it would, for instance, happen when you, when you want to share uh, a GPU amongst multiple MPI ranks. And with HyperQ, this should help now in, in the situations where you share a GPU amul amongst multiple MPI ranks. So look, let's look at this, uh, at this scaling example of an MPI application. So if we have a, a multi-core CPU system, and we have this amount of time on a single core, the light green part is the part of the application that could potentially benefit from the GPU. And then we have the part that is CPU parallelizable, but doesn't run on the GPU. And then we just have some serial part that, um, that simply cannot be scaled. Well, if we use two cores, both the, the part that could potentially parallelize on the GPU certainly will also parallelize on the CPU. And the CPU parallelizable part, will they simply will be cut in half. And if we go to four, and if we go to eight, that's the, the picture we're gonna see. The serial part will remain the same. The other ones will be proportionally reduced. Now, if you can only use a single MPI rank that touches this GPU, well, it will affect the GPU parallelizable part, and it will cut that down to, to a very small amount of time. But it will not affect the the CPU parallelizable part, because it will be exactly, the amount of CPU parallelizable work will be exactly the same as if you had just a single, um, a single core. So the best speed up in this case that you could see 
from adding a GPU to this system would be probably comparable to two cores. But it wouldn't, with just using four CPU cores, would already beat you in this situation. Now with HyperQ, and with the ability of being able to share the GPU amongst multiple MPI ranks, we will still see the same speed up on the CPU only part that we had in, with the, the pure CPU implementation. But on top of that, we also get the acceleration of the, of the GPU part. And so this allows us to nicely outperform the, um, the GPU, uh, the, the, the CPU only altogether. Now, what type of applications are very suitable for, uh, for seeing a benefit from, from proxy? And I think I might even have a picture here, right? So this was a, uh, for a code CP2K. That's a code that still does a fair amount of work on the CPU. And actually, if, you, if I come back here, if you think about it, what codes benefit the most, it's the ones that still have a fairly sizable dark green component. Because if the dark green component was nil, well, then, yeah, you would, you would just see the benefit on a, on a single, the, the overall time would still be, just be this amount. And so you would be faster with a single GPU on a single MPI rank per node. You would be faster than doing the work on, on eight CPU cores. So it's interesting for applications that still have a fair amount of work on the CPU. And it's also interesting, I mean, that, that can be by design, that a certain application simply doesn't, um, isn't suitable for GPU acceleration in, in some part. Or alternatively, it's in these cases where you're in the process of moving an application to GPUs, right? When you, when you are moving your code to GPUs, well, you start somewhere. You, you start with the most expensive kernel. Well, you might be able to accelerate that one very dramatically, but if that means that you can now use only a single CPU core, it might be that your overall speed up will be completely um, annihilated. But um, with HyperQ, you then can use all the, um, still use the same amount of concurrency that you had on the core before. So bottom line from this is that if you have a code, if you're in the process of moving a code to GPUs, or if you have a code that has a fair amount of um, CPU work, then you might be interested in, in looking into HyperQ. And so the coolest thing about all that is, even though technically it has to do with the fact that you're now using multiple streams to dispatch the work to the GPU and it's all being handled nicely by the hardware, all you have to do on a Cray system is to set the environment variable Cray CUDA proxy to one and it will allow you to use multiple MPI ranks on a single node and to let those multiple MPI ranks share the uh, GPU. Um, so we can do as one of the, um, I'll, I'll continue a little bit, but as one of the uh, samples, you can use the code that Alistair has shown you this morning, the MPI code, um, and we can run it on um, under proxy on 2D. Okay, now having all said all that, one thing to keep in mind is that, right, you're optimizing with GPUs, you're optimizing the single MPI rank part of your code. Um, never forget that there is also a whole lot of, of other parts of your code. This one here is from, I forgot what it was, but um, a profile on a close to 400 node 400 rank code, and the blue part is the actual compute part. Well, if we accelerate, and, and the rest is messaging and waiting and whatnot. If we accelerate the compute part with the GPUs, it simply means that those parts become much more expensive. So first, action item should always be make sure that the messaging is as, as optimal as possible. Oops. Now, 
I mentioned before the, uh, the cool feature, which is this, this arrow back here that goes from the streamy multiprocessors to the grid management unit. There was another thing that, um, that came out in this analysis of the different workloads that were um, used on, on Fermi GPUs. And there was just a set of applications that were very hard to, um, to get good performance on with GPUs. One thing was that there was no way of making library calls from kernels. And it was just, it's always hard to make sure what part is, needs to be on the CPU and what part needs to be on the GPU. Then we had the issues of backfilling the GPU. And as I said, with HyperQ, that's, that's one way of addressing that. And then there was all the, the things about data-dependent execution, like tree traversals or, or yeah, so parallel, uh, recursive algorithms in particular, or if you had to make certain decisions based on, um, on, on the data value. In previous, oops. So all that was, was addressed with uh, the feature called dynamic parallelism. What does dynamic parallelism mean? It's basically just that the GPU can now create work for itself. It can launch new grids on the GPU. So for instance, in the, in the previous picture, the way that CUDA is usually taught, it's you're on the CPU and you launch a kernel. The kernel executes and it's asynchronous, all fine, but eventually you get a result back from the GPU and you launch based on this result, you, you, you launch the next kernel. Um, in this case, we now launch four kernels and the result comes back and then, so the CPU is in charge, the GPU is a coprocessor. Now, with dynamic parallelism, what you can do is that the CPU kicks off the GPU and the, the kernels then make themselves a decision that they wanna create more work. And so they can, they can spawn more work and they, these kernels themselves can spawn more work and you never have to go back to the CPU and ask what should I do next. So it saves you a lot of these round trips to the CPU and it can also help you make an algorithm more, um, to express the algorithm more naturally than without it. One typical example for, for this type of applications would be some type of, of mesh refinement, right? You know that you have a certain resolution of your computational mesh and you, you see that there are some features that need to be resolved that you cannot resolve at the moment with your mesh. Well, with a statically um, decomposed mesh, you, you would have to calculate with the worst case scenario. So you would just completely over resolve some of the areas that are way outside of the, um, uh, of the area of interest. Now there is people who actually manage to do adaptive meshes with the old way of doing, uh, of writing CUDA applications. So with a pure coprocessor model, but it can be very challenging to express that um, efficiently. With dynamic parallelism, you can now make these decisions about local refinement straight on the GPU within an individual block. Um, yeah, that's, that's just another, another example. For instance, for an LU decomposition, um, and if you wanna have multiple LU decompositions that are being performed on the GPU, what you would have to do in the, in the old model is that after each one, you would have to go back to the CPU and say, well, what's my next blast call that I need to call? And then what's the next one and so on. Um, with dynamic parallelism, these decisions can now be made within the same, uh, within the, th the same thread block. So it's not necessarily a mechanism for achieving much higher performance, but it's a mechanism of expressing algorithms in a more natural form. So how does that look in, in, in practice? So here we have a, a very basic example, and that's actually one of the samples that's also in the on 30, and we will look at that afterwards, but let's just have a look at it here. So we have the main program, runs on the CPU. We launch the parent kernel, and we just use a single thread and a single block 
and then we have a device synchronized and we, we finish. Now the parent kernel is a typical kernel as you have it with the global modifier. But then inside this kernel, we have another kernel launch. And this kernel launch now calls the child kernel and the child kernel, well, does writes out some, some message. Here you can actually see a function call, in this case printf, from within a kernel. Um, so again, if you, if you haven't heard about CUDA before, or if you haven't looked at CUDA before, then this seems like, well, what's the big deal? If you've done CUDA before, then you knew that this was a complete no-no. So there is no kernel launches within, within a kernel. There was the possibility of calling printf. That's a, a simplified version. Um, so, but this could be an arbitrary function call here. Uh, there was also a complete no-no. There was no function calls um, from within kernels. The way to enable this uh, dynamic parallelism is to set an additional NVCC flag, and that's called um, RDC, which is relocatable device code to true. And then you get all these features. Um, given that we're using printf here, we also need to, to link against the runtime library. Oh, sorry, not the printf, but the, uh, sorry. The, uh, the device synchronized function here, another function that is being called. Given that we call device synchronized from within the parent kernel, requires that we load a special form of the runtime library. So we need to load the, the CUDA dev RT library as well. But let's look at this um, in practice. Vim was finished. So we have sample five. Which is exactly the same as, uh, sorry, no, sample four, sorry. So it's a, it's a tiny modification of the, the code I showed you. Um, here the, the child kernel <laughs> takes an additional parameter and then prints out its own ID and the parent ID. And the parent passes in its own thread ID to the kernel. So we are launching the parent kernel with five threads. And each one of each thread launches its new grid of the child kernel with three threads, and it passes his own ID in as an argument. So we should get five times three hello kid messages with um, the D running from zero to two and the parent running from zero to four. And this is a bit painful. OK, so here you can see the command line that was used. Um, again, we compile for SM35, so for the Kepler devices, for the, the K20X. Uh, we have the RDC, the relocatable device code flag set to true, and we link in the device version of the runtime library. Then we need to get the, um, an allocation. Well, if you have a less painful connection than I do. Um, oops, no. So. Then there is a certain hope that we get the result at one point. 
Um, yes, and so we, here it executed. So this should be 15, and we have the kids going from 1 to 2, and the parents going from, from, sorry, from 0 to 2, and the parents going from 0 to 4. So this is a, a very simple example of using CUDA dynamic parallelism. Um, it is a new feature. It's still, we're interested in hearing about what type of applications work well with this feature, what, whether it made your life easier or what changes that you would like to see. Um, it's one of those features where in, in the current implementation in CUDA 5, there's actually a few limitations that are still there, right? As you saw, we can now launch grids from within each individual thread. So you can very quickly create a huge amount of threads that are being executed, this, this huge avalanche. And so you probably will hardly ever see a, a CUDA dynamic parallelism program where a kernel just blankly says, launch this new grid. But usually the, the pattern you would see is that thread zero of a block will launch a new grid. Or that there's some other form of limiting mechanism to avoid that you're creating way too much work. Um, also, as you can imagine, somewhere you need to store the state of the individual SMs. Um, so it uses quite a bit of memory, right? Just, just imagine, I mean, each SM, in theory, can have up to 28,000 threads. Each of those 28,000 threads um, has a certain amount of, of registers that they need to, to keep uh, track of and so on. All this state needs to be saved before you then go on and, and, and compute or launch next grid. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's fairly resource intensive. But, again, the goal is not to have a, a, a very lightweight mechanism, but the goal is to make programming easier. And so, if you have an application that requires a lot of, like, tree traversals, for instance, it would be very interesting to see how CDP, CUDA dynamic parallelism, can help you to, um, to express the parallelism in your application. Um, okay. Now, another, my favorite confusogram, which is the, um, the CUDA compile trajectory. Um, I think I've, I've used the word PTX before, and um, so there's sometimes a bit of confusion of what, what is what, right? If you compile a CUDA program, it creates a binary, yes. But there is talk about, there's the CU files, the PTX files, the, uh, the Kubin files, SAS, and so on. So uh, what I'm trying to do in the, in the following is just to hopefully straighten this out a little bit. So when you have your, your source code, your test.cu file, well, what the compiler will do is, in a first pass, it will split this test.cu program into the host and device code. And the host code will actually be handed off to the host system compiler, so GCC on the, or, yeah, GCC on the Linux-based system, um, or, yeah, or on, on Windows side, it can be, it can be some, some uh, the, the Microsoft compiler. But the other part, and, and so this, the host code is just being compiled into a um, host object code that eventually needs to be linked against the host side libraries, and it produces an a.out, the, the binary. Now, the device code can be call, uh, compiled into PTX. PTX is something like an a virtual assembly language for the GPU. So it, it is basically assembly language, but it's not machine language of one particular GPU, but it's an abstract machine language. And so if you're saying I'm targeting a GPU from three years ago, or I'm targeting um, a Fermi or a Kepler GPU, well, they have different instruction sets 
And so there is a new, an additional step involved that takes the PTX code and translates it into the so-called kubin code, which is the, the code, the binary code for one particular architecture. So that's what you're selecting with SM35, architecture equals SM35. That basically says it should create binary code for the SM35 architecture. Now this kubin code, it's basically from, from the host perspective, it's just a, a piece of text. It cannot do anything with it. So before CUDA 5, what happened was that this kubin code was embedded into the object file and it was linked into the A dot out, all fine and good, but the linker here didn't have any, any insight onto this, into this um, GPU code. It just said, oh, I'm getting this additional piece of data, this additional piece of text. I don't know what to do. I'll, I treat it as text, and finally the GPU will, can do something with it. Creating code for one particular architect architecture is actually an optional thing. You can just include the PTX code in your, into your binary and then leave it to the driver, the GPU driver, that will on the fly translate this PTX code into the binaries for, for your given hardware. That's a very clever mechanism that guarantees you future, um, up, future compatibility. So you will have this abstract binary, or this, sorry, this, 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 um, uh, this virtual assembly code that's in there. And if you're now running this on a GPU that's a few years in the future, well, it most likely will have a different instruction set but there still will be a JIT compiler, a just-in-time compiler, that can understand this PTX code and on the fly convert it into the binaries for that particular architecture. So this is how it looked like in the old world, in, in the pre-CUDA 5 world. Now, as I said, the, the main problem here is that at the time of linking, the, the host linker doesn't know anymore what to do with this PTX code. For the host linker, it's just data. Now here comes the real confuser Graham. Um, so what happened now with CUDA 5 is that we introduced a device linker. So that means that with this device linker, you can actually look into CUDA code or PTX code or Kubin code that's sitting in, inside your, your object files link those pieces together, and then hand it off to the host linker that grabs the host pieces of code, and you create the final A dot out, the final binary. So long story short, the, the cool thing here is that this allows you to write libraries of device code, of kernels. Right? And so that, that's a mechanism that we use for implementing the, the device callable runtime library but it also can be a mechanism for whatever, an ISV, to write their own whatever, secret source code, secret source library that they then sell to others, and other people can then just use this library and link their uh, GPU code against. Again, if you haven't heard about CUDA before, <laughs> you, you may think, well, what's the big deal? I mean, it's that's what you do on, on the CPU time side all the time. Well, it wasn't possible prior to CUDA 5. So that's one of the nice software engineering features that got introduced in CUDA 5 uh, to allow you to do um, true device side linking. How does it look like uh, in practice? Um, so we have, if you, if you remember this picture here, maybe just a, a few more words, we have the, the two source codes, a.cu and b.cu, and we want to link them together. So in the first step, we um, compile a.cu and b.cu, and what you would do on the CPU side is you would provide the minus C flag to say, to tell the compiler it should stop after a compilation. Well, we now have the minus DC, the device compile only flag, to tell the compiler it should stop 
after compiling the device code. And so it will produce an A.0, an, an object file for both host and CPU code of A, and an object file for host and CPU code of B. And so in the second invocation, we now link with the minus D link um, A.O and B dot O together in this link dot O. And finally, we use the host linker and we link A.O, B dot O and the link dot O, which is our GPU library of um, our link together GPU code, and we produce a final binary. So just a bit, yeah, that's a fairly technical, but that's the way you would use it on the, um, uh, if you want to use a, a device code library, or if you want to write your own device code library. Prior to that, just to, to put it into perspective, prior to that, given that you couldn't l build libraries and link them together, you basically had to recompile the entire CUDA application every time you wanted to rebuild or the, all the device code. And so that could yield huge amounts of, uh, or cause just huge build times that with this mechanism are cut away now. One small thing here is that linking at the moment happens only at Kubin level. So you actually need to target one specific architecture like we do here with SM35 or SM20. Okay, um, I guess it's close to three o'clock now. Where to find additional information? So I've, I'm fully aware it's, it's a lot of material, short time. If, if you're new to the material, it's, it might be a bit overwhelming. Um, as I said, docsandvideo.com contains all the knowledge about um, the GPUs. If you're new to CUDA, I would start with either the best practices guide or the C programming guide. Um, there's a Kepler white paper that describes all the additional features and I think it's, um, I don't have it here. But it's, it's, it's also linked from the, um, from the um, CUDA website, the docs and video.com. And that's it for now. So if there's any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, I think we're, we are supposed to have either a break or alternatively a tour of the computer room. With now an attribute called global uh, that it identifies these subroutines as kernels. So this is not meant to be an example. It just should give you a bit of flavor, a feeling for how it looks like to, to write CUDA Fortran code. Um, the, the upside is definitely that you have a, um, a, a very Fortran-like approach to CUDA. The downside is that it's currently only supported by PGI. But PGI's compiler is available on Tody. Um, so you can give it a try there if you just want to play around with um, some examples. Okay, so what I didn't talk about this morning was anything about the optimization. And frankly, there's a lot of talks out online about doing optimizations in general, CUDA optimizations. There is lots of material. Uh, please just go out and, and Google for whatever, CUDA optimization, and you will find uh, various presentations. Um, I also can talk about streams um, in, in very much detail, so we'll, we'll come back to that. And uh, the multi-GPU programming is another thing that um, I simply ignored so far. Okay, now coming to this afternoon's topic, which is uh, CUDA 5 and Kepler. So first I, I want to talk a bit about Kepler itself, one data from GPU memory onto the streaming multiprocessors and writing it back out. You should be able to at least get close to the theoret theoretical bandwidth 
that you could have on this device. And you can infer that from the width of your bus, the clock of your, um, of your memory system, and that's another one of those numbers that you can determine based on the um, um, either look up in the specs or, or determine by, by some figures that are reported by tools that are available on Tony. So that's a, a, a weak but some of a, somewhat of a justification for showing you these numbers. Anyway, comparing the Kepler streaming multiprocessor to the, to, to the Fermi streaming multiprocessor shows that what happened between these two generations is that the amount of parallelism has increased again quite dramatically. So we have many more of the floating point units that sit on, on each one of these um, processors. We have more double precision units and um, they have introduced new instructions that can help you get more performance out of the chip. A bit in more detail, what has changed? So we have more floating point units that can lead to a higher throughput of, of floating point instructions. But that's not all. We can also have more CUDA blocks per SM. On Fermi, it was up to eight blocks. On Kepler, we can have the X. The GPU that you have in Tudi is one product that has a GK110 chip. Now, the different products that are being produced with, with this one chip differ in the number of streaming multiprocessors that you have. So while a GK110 chip can have up to 15 streaming multiprocessors, the products that are being sold have either 14 or 13 or even fewer uh, streaming multiprocessors. So that's where the, the whole confusion came about why, how many SMs that there are. On a, a GK110 chip, in theory, you can have up to 15 streaming multiprocessors. Technicality, and given that you're not buying the machine, but it's already there, it doesn't really matter. But it's, um, yeah, just wanted to, to mention that. Um, so yeah, we have up to 15 streaming multiprocessors. Each one of those chips can, in theory, deliver more than a teraflop of uh, floating point, um, double precision floating point performance. Has a sizable cache that's twice as large as the one that we had on the Fermi chip and has a 384 gigabyte, a 384 bit GDDR5 interface to the memory on the device. I'm not particularly keen on, on all these technical numbers, but some of these numbers can be useful to just have somewhere sitting around for reference if you're doing a theoretical performance analysis of a kernel, right? If you know that your kernel doesn't do anything else than reading the last part of this presentation, which is not uh, very fundamental stuff, but just one slide that I wanna show. Again, given, given that we have so many Fortran programmers here, uh, just to give you a, a feeling of how the Fortran looks like, uh, for instance, for in PGI's CUDA Fortran, as I said, the one approach is the mixed language approach. So basically on the, on the Fortran side, you have a call my func, oh, the, there's a C missing, <laughs> call my func, and then you have an extern C, C function that then launches the, the kernel. So that's one approach. Um, the upside is it works with any compiler, um, fairly straightforward. The only problem is that you have to worry about A, the calling conventions, that's uh, whether you need to underscore the function name or not when you call C from, from the Fortran side. Um, and you have to worry about two different languages, so that can be a bit inconvenient. Now with a PGI's CUDA Fortran, um, you have extensions to Fortran <laughs> that, uh, for instance, if you have an array U that has a certain dimension, you can create arrays uh, that are, have the attribute device that will live on the GPU. And so by simply by assigning U to A, you're copying data between host and GPU. Um, you have a mechanism for calling kernels, so you, uh, CUDA Fortran also supports the triple Chevron notation, 
Um, so otherwise, those are similar, simple function. What the, what the chip does and what the des design decisions were behind it. And then later on come to some of the, uh, the new features that are supported by CUDA 5. For those of you who knew 30 before it became an XK7, where while it was still an XK6, at that point it had a Fermi-based GPU, which is just a, the generation before Kepler. Um, Kepler devices became available early 2012, and the GK110 became available in the second half of, um, of 2012. The goal was to provide a step up in terms of performance from the previous generation, to also make it much more energy efficient. So basically, increasing performance and drawing more power, that's quote unquote easy. But improving performance without requiring more power, that's, that's much more difficult. And that was the goal of, of the Kepler um, device. And the last um, focus was on programmabil programmability. Uh, so to make life easier for developers to get to a good utilization of the device. So we come back to the famous uh, GK110 block diagram um, <clears throat> with the, the 15 streaming multiprocessors. And here's the, the subtle difference, right? GK110, that's the name of the chip that sits on the GPU. And that's, uh, that's the, the chip that's a whole family of different products. And the K20 